Kia ora koutou koutou. Welcome to this wet weekend of Auckland Anniversary Day. I want to talk about the Cosmic Christ and Tilha de Chardin. There's a theological phrase, Cosmic Christ, that was first coined probably by Pierre Tilha de Chardin in the 1920s. But the origins of what it attempts to express are far earlier than that. You may be familiar with the distinction made between Jesus and the Christ. Jesus refers to the historical man, his Jewish name, Yeshua ben Yosef, who lived, taught, and was executed in Palestine in the early decades of the first century. The Christ refers to the ongoing life, in inverted commas, of this Jesus after his crucifixion. So depending on your theological leanings, this life might be manifested in an invisible personal saviour who abides in a skyward heaven, as some traditional doctrine seems to point to, or be manifest in the community of Jesus' followers, like when Paul suggested to the Corinthians that we, together, are the body of Christ. <clears throat> it's important to not think of the Christ as a man, or a human even, but more as an essence, an energy, a spirit, the lowercase s, that can artistically then be depicted in many forms. And yet this Christic essence energy has a direct correlation with the essence energy of the historical Yeshua ben Yusuf. An example, if we call this essence compassion, then how we understand compassion is framed, though maybe not constrained, by the parables and other stories and teachings of the historical man, Jesus. The cosmic Christ is different again, <clears throat> drawing upon the, the prologue, the beginning of the fourth gospel, John's gospel, and the pseudo-Pauline letters of Colossians and Ephesians. In the prologue, this Christ was present at the very beginning of creation evolution like the Jewish personification of wisdom or the Greek personification of a divine spark, translated in English Bibles as word. Indeed, Paul calls the Christ the wisdom of God, in other words, the personification of the wisdom of God. On the one hand, then, this cosmic Christic energy has always existed and is the genesis of life and consciousness. On the other hand, as spoken of by Irenaeus of Lyon, famous bishop of the second century, the cosmic Christ is that which restores and recapitulates, Irenaeus's word, all of creation into a unity of connection. See, for Irenaeus and for Eastern Christianity generally, the resurrection of Jesus is not primarily about Jesus as an individual coming back from the dead, but the restoration from the deathly ways of evil and sin, the restoration of all of humanity and all of creation. So this cosmic Christic energy is not only beginning, the Alpha, creation, evolution, but as the restoration and fulfillment, the omega, of evolution, creation. As you might imagine in the second half of the 20th century, as we became, like never before, aware that not only could we destroy human and ecological life on a massive scale, like with nuclear armaments, but that we were already doing so through the warming of our planet, polluting our atmosphere, food and water, 
and destroying forest ecosystems and species in non-recoverable ways. Eco-theologians in the West took a renewed interest in the concept of the cosmic Christ. Rather than the idea of a personalised Christ saving souls and rapturing them to an off-the-planet heaven, the cosmic Christic spirit was about saving the whole planet and universe. Not through some cataclysmic Armageddon, but by working in, with and for the restoration, the restorative power of love, mutuality, connection, unity. Humans and all life, organic and inorganic, seen and unseen, working together interdependently to bring the renewal of all. Scholars like Jürgen Moltmann, Matthew Fox, Richard Raw picked up de Charan's language to speak about the Christ's concern for all creation. Note that by the Christ they meant both the ongoing living essence of the historical Jesus manifested in the church and elsewhere, and the Christic life energy that is Alpha and Omega. Fox in particular saw this Christic energy and purpose manifesting on the margins of politics and religion rather than in the mainstream, from those excluded from power rather than those wielding power, and especially amongst indigenous peoples whose traditions were more earth-centered and promoted an interdependence with the land, bush, creatures and waters. Fox, though, was not the first to understand the ecumenical, that would mean the whole earth uniting, ramifications of the cosmic Christ. In 1961, at the World Council of Churches in New Delhi, Paul Devanandam argued that the cosmic Christ united all things, including those of Christian and non-Christian religions. This rationale undergirded the work of M.M. M. Thomas and D.T. Niles on the subcontinent. In China, too, the rationale of a cosmic Christ resonated and can be seen, for example, in the work of K.H. Ting's dialogue between Christians and communists. Maybe the roots of the phrase cosmic Christ for Chinese theologians also is grounded in Teilhard de Chardin's thinking and writing. For it was to China that the Catholic Church banished him in 1923 and where he lived and worked and wrote for the next 23 years, till 1946. Chardin was born in France, 1881, and trained in both paleontology and theology under the guidance of the Jesuit order, and then later he trained in geology. So he was both a scientist and priest, and would spend his life exploring the connection between the two. <coughs> he ran foul of the ecclesiastical authorities, which then led to his exile, firstly around the doctrine of original sin. Tilha argued that the fall of Adam and Eve into sin was difficult to reconcile with science for two reasons. Firstly, fossils suggested that the human species emerged out of several different evolutionary branches, not from a single pair of ancestors. And second, an earthly paradise from which death was absent was scientifically inconceivable given that the tendency toward physical disintegration is a condition of existence. Instead, Tilha read the early chapters of Genesis as allegories. The authorities at the time, as literalism was coming to the fore across Christianity, saw this as an alarming deviation from orthodoxy, whereas to most of us it's common sense. Creation is not an event, 
but an evolutionary process of becoming. Secondly, Tilha questioned and challenged the dualism that divided so-called secular matter and sacred spirit. The philosophical origins of this division can be found in the Greek thought of Plato and in the Christian thought of Augustine of Hippo. Augustine taught about the war between matter and spirit, between body and soul. The former to be subjugated, the latter to be privileged. Fox calls dualistic thinking the foundation of, of patriarchy. Shadan, however, understood the incarnation, the revelation of God on earth, as a manifestation that, I quote, the world, this palpable world, which we are wont to treat with boredom and disrespect, with which we habitually regard places with no sacred association for us, is in truth a holy place, and we do not know it. Bit of a biblical quote there from Jacob at the end. Matter and spirit were no longer two things, but two states or two aspects of the one and same cosmic stuff, both infused with divine presence. Traditional understandings of the holy regarded secular work and the world as at best burdens to endure. Worldly knowledge, like science, was thought to lead to pride. Sharan upended this thinking. It was through work in science, technology, government, education, and the unities of peoples that Christians were called to collaborate in the development of the cosmos. There was no split between human work and spirituality. For God was not an outsider, not some clockwinder God, distant and remote, but a creative spirit God, still creating through the evolutionary process, inviting our collaboration. In Shadan's words, By means of all created things, <clears throat> without exception, the divine assails us, penetrates us, and moulds us. We imagine the divine is distant and inaccessible, when in fact we live steeped in its burning layers. Quote, you'll see a move away from anthropomorphizing God by using the pronoun its and the metaphor of fire, the burning layers. 2018, the American bishop, Michael Curry, preached a memorable sermon at the wedding of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. And in it he said that Tilha had called fire one of the greatest discoveries in human history and said if humanity ever captures the energy of love, it will be the second time in history that we have discovered fire. Elsewhere, Shadan writes, all realities, all experiences, all our activities, all our joys and sufferings have this potential for divinization, for being set on fire through the outpouring of divine love. Above all else, therefore, cosmic, Christic, essence, energy, fire, is acts of love, no matter how small or hidden, drawing all into connection. Sharan believed, and we can hear in this the mystic more than the scientist, that this love energy is, the very, is in every particle of the universe, drawing everything that exists into connection. So love isn't just a human thing, but the very energy of evolution. Love is at the heart of reality. Well, I admire much of Tilhard de Chardin's thinking, and as you might recognize and hear the echoes, it's 
been a ground of my theology and many other theologians and ministers. But we also need to be aware of the limitations of Jihad's thinking. Shadan was gripped by an optimism that science, coupled with spirituality, would lead to salvation. He saw no need to put ethical boundaries around technological progress. Science was a good in itself. Nowadays we generally have a more measured view of science, seeing it as a human endeavour and, like every human endeavour, corruptible. He also saw the processes of evolution as making humanity better and better, physically, spiritually, morally, constantly moving towards a point of perfection, the future giving purpose to the present. Not many today would share that view. With this adoration of science, as the early eco-theologian Thomas Berry points out, Shadan, whilst he saw all matter as sacred, also believed in a hierarchy of humankind over every other kind. The earth was to be subservient to human ends, and thus subservience was the sole way the earth could find its true meaning. Sounds like a license to pollute and exploit, doesn't it? And Shadan's belief in hierarchy did not end there. In the latter part of his life, and even after the horrors of the Holocaust were revealed, Tilha believed in a hierarchy of races, in social Darwinism and eugenics. So-called superior races and people were to be privileged, and so the so-called weak and porous disregarded. Again, we are reminded of the fallacy of building a conception of the divine, the cosmic Christ, that loses reference and does not correspond to the teachings, mission and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. The Christic fire of love energy that can build connection between all things and maybe is in all things must be rooted in the compassion, justice and breadth of the Jesus vision. Love is too vague a word, too easy to be manipulated for the ends of the powerful to not have a reference point. And our reference point is Jesus. Blessings to you.